our next speakers are Dr. Michael Dahl and Dr. Sophia Shan. And Dr. Michael Dahl is a senior lecturer at UOE and ZJE as part of the Integrative Biomedical Science Program. And he's been part of the ZJE program for about six years. So he was one of the first four UOE lecturers employed before the start of the program to develop it, along with Melanie Stefan. <laughs> And before that, he was a research fellow in Edinburgh in neuroscience. And Dr. Sophia Shen is a teaching fellow at the School of Education in the University of Edinburgh, where she did her PhD. Uh, she was the student experience researcher of this project, working with BMS undergraduate students in both UOE and ZJE. Now, I'll pass it over to you guys now. Hello, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, take the, the start of this and introduce it. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. OK, so we're going to be talking about um, our project in which we compared the transition experiences of our students in China on our TNE program there compared to the students that are on a, a similar program in Edinburgh. I will start off by talking about the, the overall context and the motivation for the study and talking about the survey resu results. Uh, and then Sophia will um, take you in a, a bit more detail with some um, results from some of the interviews that she did as part of this study. So to start off talking about the, the context and mot context of the programs and the motivation for the study. As Christine just said, I was one of the, the first four Edinburgh lecturers um, hired for uh, to develop this program in integrative biomedical sciences at um, the joint institute between Edinburgh University and Zhejiang University. We were hired back in 2015, and this top photograph here shows the, our first visit at the start of 2016 when the, the campus was still a building site. And this is all on a dedicated campus, which is shared with the other joint institutes, but it's separate campus from the rest of the university. And below is the campus in its state now. Um, the program is was developed from, from scratch. It was a new program. So unlike some of the other programs at joint institutes, it wasn't imported from any of, any of the uh, host um, institutions. We developed it from scratch. It was developed together between Edinburgh and Zhejiang, but I think it's probably fair to say that the, the four of the original lecturers had the, the major part in the development of the programme. Um, we all came from a, a Western education background. Um, Melanie is the only one that, that had significant teaching experience outside the UK. Joanne was uh, also one of the lecturers, is not British, but I think most of her teaching experience is in the UK. So it was very much a Western and mainly UK based experience we had. And actually I was an Edinburgh University student and I've been, all of my teaching experience came from Edinburgh University. I've not been there all the time. I did, did leave briefly, um, but that's just to give the, an idea of the context of the people developing the program. When I was involved in this, I decided I'd, I'd look at some existing research to see, do I need to consider different things for this type of program? So I looked into some of the existing literature Oh, I wanted to mention briefly some terminology. Um, in Edinburgh, when we talk about the whole degree, we talk about programmes. And when we talk about the individual chunks of that programme, we call them courses. This is different terminology from some other places in case this comes up and confuses people. So when I looked at the, the literature about these types of programmes in, in Asia, and I look generally in, in East Asia, the first thing that came up is language issues. That's not surprising. We're teaching students who mostly don't have English as a first language. Language is obviously going to be an issue. But then I came across a lot of stereotypes about Asian students. In some cases, the, the studies were confirming these stereotypes. And in other places, they were just listing what stereotypes existed. These stereotypes that Asian students expect to be spoon fed facts, that they're reluctant to speak in class and that they're hardworking. When I was reading these things, I, I wondered if actually some of these um, results that have come out of these types of studies are actually a reflection of the questions that were being asked rather than the students they were being asked of. To give examples of this, I've given some quotes from studies looking at the transition to being first year undergraduate students in the UK and some studies looking at first year transition in students in English language programmes in China. In the UK, the main problems that were identified were things like practical issues, 
including poor accommodation or coping with life away from home and understanding specialist vocabulary. I thought, I'm not, not sure where it matters where you're degree, doing your degree or what sort of person you are, they're likely to be issues. And similarly, the, as I've just mentioned, um, in, in these TNE studies, there were um, suggestions that Asian students expect the tutors to spoon feed them. I'm actually not convinced that that doesn't also happen in the UK. And then this quote, Asian students do not have much experience in teamwork. They found it difficult to work in a team, especially with members that are not cooperative or are unreliable. I mean, who, which one of us is able to work well in a team with uncooperative and unreliable team members? Of course, that's difficult. So I wondered if these, these results really reflect the questions that are being asked. I thought that th these programmes gave us a good opportunity to make a direct comparison. Because I, I also teach on a biomedical sciences programme in Edinburgh. So in Edinburgh, there is a four year biomedical sciences program, part of the, some of the students are classed as medical sciences rather than biomedical sciences, but it's a similar pathway. We have around 200 students per year. Um, it's highly multinational. We have students from lots and lots of different countries on these programs in Edinburgh, and they're obviously studying for a University of Edinburgh degree. And in China, based in Haining in Zhejiang, that's, that's this new campus that I showed you the pictures of, we have a, a four year integrative biomedical sciences program. Actually, now we have another program, but when this study was carried out, we only had this one program. And we have around 100 students per year. We, we're aiming for a, a total of 150 per year eventually, and our, our numbers are still building. At the moment, the vast majority of our students are, are Chinese nationals. There is an aim to increase the number of international students, but it's it's over 90% Chinese, actually quite a lot over 90% Chinese. Um, unlike one of the other programmes that was mentioned earlier today in this session, um, these degrees are based entirely in China. There's no movement between the two sites. None of these students come to Edinburgh, but they do get a degree from Edinburgh and a degree from ZJU. So using this, we decided we can try to compare these two programmes. And our key research questions are, firstly, how do teaching, learning and assessment practices in the learning environment affect transition experiences in both programmes? And secondly, how do expectations, motivations and concerns of the two cohorts of students affect the transition experience? Before I go into the results and actually the methodology, I wanted to briefly mention a few differences in the context. There's not just the situation that we're, we're having Chinese students in one place and other students in the UK who are multinational. There are a few other differences as well. <clears throat> in um, Zhejiang, we have uh, in the first year in particular, there's a high density of the Ministry of Education required courses. These are obviously present in all degree programs in China, <clears throat> but there was a decision taken to concentrate those in the first year. And actually a lot of these courses only receive um, Zhejiang University credit, they don't receive credit for their Edinburgh University degree. And that means the students in Zhejiang are actually doing a lot more study than the students in Edinburgh. They're studying on more courses. Also, the, the physical location of the students is different. On the left here is actually a picture that I took from the room I was staying in on our campus. And in all of the rest of this building, there are, there are students staying in these rooms. And the two buildings you can see just behind that are actually the two main teaching buildings. So the students are all staying on campus. They're all in university accommodation. They're right next to where they teach. And just to the left, if we could see it, would be the campus canteen where they eat almost all of their meals. And obviously, I said this was the room I was staying in. They're also staying in the same place as a lot of their teaching staff. So everything's very integrated. And in the distance, we can see Haining. Actually, this is a few years ago now. I've not been to Haining for about a year and a half. I suspect it's come a lot closer now because it's expanding at such a rate. And on the right, we have a photograph of Edinburgh. And actually, the Edinburgh University students are scattered all across the city. And most of the first year students are living in university accommodation, but it's not on the campus. And about two thirds of those students are actually self catering. So it's a much more independent life. And I think that's gonna be relevant, particularly in some of the things Sophia talks about. Another difference is that um, in Edinburgh, the students have a lot more choice over what elective courses they take. And actually some of their elective courses 
um, that they take are not put on by biomedical sciences. They're run by other other schools. And in some cases, there those courses are open to lots of other students. So there's a lot more variety in the courses taken by the students in Edinburgh. There's also a different in, difference in the balance of assessment. In um, Zhejiang, most of our um, courses, are, most of the courses, particularly in first year, have exams, but the exam is a fairly small component of the assessment, so typically around 30%. In Edinburgh, um, the, the courses that do have exams, the exam mark is typically the majority of the uh, the mark for the total of the course. So it's typically around 60 or 70 percent of the, the whole of the course. Actually, interestingly, in first year, there are a couple of courses in Edinburgh, but not in Zhejiang. In Edinburgh, there's a couple of courses that have no exams. And again, that's going to be relevant, particularly for what Sophia talks about. Oh, and I've forgotten to put numbers in here. Sorry, Sophia, you gave me these numbers and I've forgotten to put them in. Um, the, to talk about our study design, we decided what we were going to do is we were going to do some, some surveys at the beginning of first year, and actually particularly for the Edinburgh students, it was before they started in um, Zhejiang, it was the, right at the very start of the, the first year on their first day. And again, at the end of first year, beginning of second year. So we gave surveys which were mainly multiple choice, but there are also a few te free text questions. And then uh, we also did interviews at similar times. So for those interviews, I recruited S Sophia, who at the time was a PhD student in education in Edinburgh. And I think it's important to say she wasn't involved. She's not involved in either program. Uh, and I thought that was important that the person doing the interviews was not one of the teaching staff on the programs. For the surveys, we hijacked some surveys for the, the, the starting surveys from some that were developed by Debbie Shaw, who is our senior tutor in biomedical sciences in Edinburgh. I also want to point out that all of this was completed pre-pandemic, so none of this is talking about the results of the pandemic or us not being able to be there. So now that's the uh, content. Can add, Michael, can I just add the number of the interviews? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, it might be helpful here. So basically for the interviews, uh, we did lots of individual interviews. And for the student in Edinburgh, we found eventually 13 students who were willing to participate. But in Zhejiang, it's a lot easier and we got 20. So that was the first round. And at the end of the first year, we did it again. And then uh, in Edinburgh, we only had seven left. And in Zhejiang, we had 13. It's still a good number. Okay, thank you very much, Sophia. I'm sorry for not putting those in. Um, okay, to go through some of the results, I'm going to start off by just showing you a couple of graphs from some of the, the multiple choice questions that we asked them. And one of the first things we asked them was basically, how are you feeling? Um, and we gave them the, op the option of saying they were not anxious, they were slightly anxious, or they were very anxious. And it may be obvious to, to most of us, but I think it's important to confirm that the, the vast majority of the students class themselves as slightly anxious. There's no big difference between these two cohorts of students. Most students are slightly anxious about starting their degree. So that's similar. But when we looked into what the causes of that anxiety is, what were those students concerned about? We found that there were different reasons for the anxiety. So the typical reasons for the, the Zhejiang students were things like workload or course content. They were worried about what they were going to be studying and how much work it was going to be. They were also worried by studying in English, and I think that's particularly unsurprising. The Edinburgh students, in contrast, were worried about things such as uh, managing a job alongside studying, which I'm not sure any of our students in Zhejiang do. But they were particularly worried about social aspects like making friends and connections, moving away from families or, or friends in their hometown or um, settling to, into university life. So there was a lot more focus on social issues for the Edinburgh students versus um, sort of work issues for the Zhejiang students. I also thought it was interesting in the free text comments at the start of the degree, uh, one of the Edinburgh students said, said that they thought one of the big differences was going to be that they were they were not going to be spoon fed as they were in earlier education. And um, Sophia's not going to go into this in her section, but I think you, you heard similar comments in your interviews. Is that right, Sophia? Yeah, uh, so it's quite interesting in the interviews, both of the Edinburgh students and Zhejiang students 
um, kind of complained a little about uh, this is getting really hard. They, they require lots of independent study. And for example, Edinburgh student would say before they would only need to put what it is in the report, for example. And now they also have to explain why. So that there's a lot of critical thinking and independent thinking involved. And so the teachers no longer like nudge them for the homework or, or tell them what to do. So this is quite surprising. I think it contradict with the previous findings in other research. Yeah, so I think it confirms a lot of what people say about students in Asia, but actually the students in the UK were pretty similar as well. And also when we asked them what their plans were for, for the coming year, what they were going to focus on, these two quotes, I think from these from free text questions, I think they summarize the typical differences. An Edinburgh student said they were planning to have a good balance between studying and socializing. A lot of it is about life as a, as a university student, whereas the Chinese student plans were typically things along the lines of studying hard, trying my best to meet the deadline and to improve my academic skills. So that's what they were thinking about before they started or just as they were starting. But what about at the end of first year when they've had their experience? How, how did that first year experience match those anxieties and expectations? Well, firstly, we, we asked them what was most satisfying or enjoyable about their first year. And again, the, the most common response for the most satisfying or enjoyable thing from the Edinburgh students was getting to know new people, whereas very few Dejang students said that that was their most satisfying thing. Actually, quite a few mentioned it as a satisfying thing, but not the single most satisfying. One thing in common is that both of the both cohorts of students seem to really appreciate the, the subject matter. They, they really appreciated learning about biomedical sciences. And again, if this was not the most satisfying, but what was enjoyable in general, that was very high for both cohorts of students. And what was a, a thing that's surprising to me, but has actually appeared in lots of our other surveys for lots of other things throughout the program, is that um, Jijiang students were really interested in learning new academic skills. So it was the skills rather than the grades that they got that was really um, the focus for the Jijiang students. And you can see actually that there were more Edinburgh students who focused on getting good grades. Um, and again, if we looked at not the most satisfying, but just one of the satisfying things, that would be much higher for the Edinburgh students than it was for the, the Jijiang students. Um, I don't know, did you have anything to add on that matter, Sophia? Uh, yeah, it's actually quite interesting in the in the interviews because we get to break it down and ask really the details because the survey is talking about the grade and in in basically individual cases, we found out that Edinburgh students would talk about grade a lot because they kind of feel it is very, very important for their future application for a master's degree or uh, some other kind of like uh, internship. So they think this really matters. But in uh, Zhejiang, students talk about their ranking all the time. So basically to them, ranking grades are basically the same thing. And the main reason is because they have very high scholarship waiting for them. And so it, they are kind of in direct competition with each other. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think that that matches some of our experience as teachers on this program that we hear the students worrying about their rankings. Um, okay, so when we asked them what they found challenging in their first year, this actually matches a lot what their concerns were in the first place, and that the the, the Dijang students were were found that the total workload or course content was a big challenge and studying in English was a big challenge and managing the demands of studying at this level was a big challenge. So a lot of their challenges are work related or language related. Whereas in Edinburgh, um, things like the making friends and connections and moving away from family and friends in high hometown was still considered a major challenge. But remember, it was also one of the most satisfying things was making new friends. So it's it's a positive and a negative for the students in Edinburgh. But what was really striking was the the single biggest challenge for both cohorts of students was self-organization and time management. And I think that's something that um, we've been meaning to take take forward to try and give the students more help about time management. We had some plans for this year, but they, they ended up uh, going by the wayside as a result of the pandemic. Um, and again, some quotes to uh, to emphasize the, the difference in the, the views about what was important between these two lots of students is uh, 
what we asked them what would they request that the, we could do to make life better for them or make their studies better for them a typical edinburgh student request was pre please provide more opportunities that are not optional for students in the same course to get to know each other so they're they're saying they need to they want to get to know each other uh, well, there's a Chinese student request, a typical one is to make the first semester busier and the second semester freer. So they're again focusing on work issues. And it, obviously these are selective quotes, but they are fairly typical. So the, I think the, the key conclusions from these uh, surveys was firstly that the, the uh, Ed, Edinburgh students are more concerned with social aspects of university life. Uh, and whilst Chinese students struggle more with English and scientific writing, and that's things that support previous findings, but we also found some unexpected differences, such as the fact that Chinese students tend to develop on focus on their development of new skills, while the Edinburgh students focus more on getting good grades. Was there a major similarity that came out was that organisation and time management was a major problem for both cohorts. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Sophia, who's going to take you through some of the things that she found in the interviews. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm going to present some of the interview findings. Of course, it, it covers lots of stories, lots of individual cases. So I'm just going to pick out a few that stands out. So first of all, I'm going to just briefly talk about the similar challenges the students found in the in the first year transition. And surprisingly, like what we mentioned a few before, they are actually quite similar in terms of teaching and learning. So for example, when the structure of the day is quite irregular and predictable even sometimes, like they might sometimes have a tutorial in the morning and then lecture in the, in the evening, and then they have the whole day basically just empty, then lots of students struggle to find out how to fill that time and how to use it efficiently. And for Edinburgh students, they are kind of like in a, in a very compact environment. They have food, they have um, accommodation, they have the library just all together. But to them, it's still very difficult to, to fill up all the time in between all the sessions. And for Edinburgh students, it's even harder because they, they live there as well. So they also need to think about the time to do grocery shopping, to do laundry. So uh, basically lots of students find it's very hard to balance and to to live a kind of like very efficient life, just like when they were in secondary school or in college. And the second one, Michael? Click, yeah, <laughs> okay. So the second one is uh, they both found their uh, tutors or lectures are not as kind of like closely monitoring them as before. And I think this is something we expect because it's very different between university and the high school. Michael, next one. I think it's taking a while for them to appear. I'll, I'll, I'll stick them all up on the screen because it's advancing yeah. slowly. Yeah, so yeah, good. Uh, so, uh, and another thing is, I think is a bit of surprising is uh, we would imagine Edinburgh students are going to be very good at writing because most of them have the English as their native language. Uh, some of the students I interviewed are not exactly from the UK, but all of them have done either IB or uh, a GCSE or uh, uh, Scottish higher. So even though they are, they might be European students, but they have gone, gone through this kind of training to get them prepared, but they still struggle in essay writing. And needless to say for the Chinese students, it, it's very, very hard as well. Um, the, the last one, I think it would be quite interesting to talk about because um, a lot of students will say, well, Chinese students are very good at memory-based exam and uh, this is how they approach study whatsoever, but it's actually not just for Chinese students because a lot of students who went through IB or GCSEs, they also talk about before the way they approach um, exams were just to do a very intensive cramming right before the exam and it works as it took them there to the top university but now uh, both of the cohorts start to feel it's probably not going to work anymore but for different reasons because of the, the the structure and the whole curriculum as Michael mentioned before but between the two cohorts are, are slightly different so for the for the Edinburgh students, they do have assignments, and but they they have a very lower proportion to to be included in the final exam, final final uh, grades. But in uh, Zhejiang, they basically they have lots of 
assessment, quiz, and everything would count, and it's a, a larger proportion. This is why cramming doesn't work. They have to be very alert all the time, study very hard across the whole semester. Whereas in uh, Edinburgh, they still do cramming, but they're very worried because it's very intensive at the end for the whole big exam, which is really uh, important, but they won't have enough time to stuff everything in their head. So this is something they, they talk about and they were really concerned. So next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to talk more de in details about the differences we found between the two cohorts. So for example, they, they both have learning shock, but they are very, very different. So let's just get on with it. Uh, Michael, could you just click and I'm going to introduce one by one. Okay, so uh, there is a, a very interesting example about the learning shock Edinburgh students experienced. So Edinburgh students are very good at dealing with workshops and tutorials. They are good at having uh, conversations, discussions within group or with the teachers because they are used to this. This is very, very similar to their previous learning experience. But when it comes to lectures, they are, they are feeling very kind of like uh, lots of like lot of pressure going on there because you have to write very fast during the lecture and if you have your mind split like kind of like slip for two seconds and then you, you can't follow anymore so those things all come up and they are not used to it and also um, for example this student particularly quoted here mentioned because the lectures are changing almost every session and it took her a long time to get used to each lecture's style in order to find out which is the part that's more important how lectures emphasize those things that would be in the exam so she was really struggling about how to prepare for a lecture even though she tried and another example uh, michael next next slide please another example would be uh, the, the, it's really interesting uh, phenomenon actually. Uh, the student was like, so is the textbook really the textbook? And is, is the lecture just really what matters in the exam? Because she wants to know, do I need to know all this stuff even though, uh, so sometimes lectures would go beyond what the handout is or the, the slides or whatever is in the textbook. So she was really confused, like, do I need to know all of those? Are they important in the exam? Do I need to be tested? So actually, Michael, I want to pick up your brain and, and see how you respond to this as a lecturer. Yeah, I think this is something that we, we instinctively understand differently from the students. I think to most that most of our teaching staff the textbook is there to support the learning. It's an, an extra thing for the students to look at if they've not learned everything they want from the lecture. And I think the students are not always clear about that. And in my personal case, I've explicitly told them, you don't need to learn the textbook. It's just there to help you. But they still, the fact that we have a course textbook seems to throw them a bit and they, they, they feel that they're missing out on something and that someone's gonna trick them into sticking a question from the exam that wasn't from the lecture. And I think, in, my experience particularly in the early years in later years it's different but in the in first year there's not there's not going to be anything in exams that that's in the textbook that we haven't mentioned in a lecture and i think that's something we need to communicate better with our students yeah please do i think students are very confused and i think that it's very nice we found out so please uh, next slide please so Okay, so for Zhejiang students, the lecture stuff is not a problem. They're so used to it because this is how they used to approach all the learning and this is how they were taught. So basically just sit there with a notebook and you don't speak. But now they are encountering different ways of teaching, like for example, workshop and tutorials. And apart from being struggling like, oh, I didn't know I had to answer questions. Now I need to really get engaged. Apart from that, um, they also found that something very interesting. So for example, uh, when in the tutorial, uh, the teachers would give them some sort of assignment and they'd have a discussion and they found out that they, the, the way they used to study by checking with each other or the tutor, if am I getting the right answer and okay, then I'm done. Uh, now it's completely different. They need to have 
can, can be encounter very different perspectives and they need to understand like how did you get that result even though it's different from mine but maybe you are using a different approach so this kind of way is definitely benefit beneficial to the students but in the very beginning student literally told me that he was shocked when he found out that oh really i can get a different answer uh, so uh, these things actually uh, eventually led to something else so i'm going to give you an, another example in the click again please so so this kind of i would say broader horizon or different perspectives all inclusive together make some of the students um, very interested in no matter what is tested in the exam, it doesn't matter anymore. She started to show interest in everything she get to contact. For example, different perspective or anything, the lecture would go beyond the textbook because she said, I feel I'm free now. I don't study for the exam. I study for the sake of the study because I'm really interested. So, so she's kind of like exploring different uh, different perspective and, and a, a broader knowledge in the world instead of just thinking I'm a student, I'm studying because I have exam to do. So I think these are definitely something very positive. So next one. And uh, in terms of a learning approach for the for the next few, uh, because of time, I'm not going to go into very details, but I'm, I want to present some of the very interesting phenomena we found. So for example, for the learning approaches, Edinburgh students are some of them reported uh, even in details how they consolidate notes they don't do daily studies they go to lecture they go to tutorial and they sort of know what's going on but they only start to consolidate notes and basically uh, organize everything they know uh, together before the exam and they, they would have maybe a big mind map or maybe they would have their own notebook organized but they do try to consolidate and enrich the content by themselves. So for example, they would go out to uh, Google Scholar or some other research paper to find out something to explain to them better than what the lecturer said so that can help them understand it better. And so, so basically they are doing lots of independent learning in this sense. But for Zhejiang students, it's very interesting that they would be a lot more hardworking. They would preview and review every lecture. They would be uh, fully prepared before they go to the lecture because they want to go with questions, with things they don't understand. And then they would organize their notes again. But they never uh, really enrich any content in their notebook. And so basically before the exam, the way they approach the, the exams are they would read through the lecture notes and other slides all over again and again so they can remember all of them and then they go. So uh, I was really interested in this uh, very huge difference. So I asked them like, uh, so did you feel you need to find something to kind of consolidate your notes? And uh, some of them said they did, but only because if if it's in English, they don't completely understand. So they would go to find a Chinese kind of like experiment or whatever report that can help them understand some certain theories. So if it's not for that reason, they wouldn't really go beyond what the teacher told them. And, and surprisingly, the way they do it is basically enough to get the exam passed. So I actually want to hear from uh, Michael again. Uh, how would you comment on this phenomenon? I think... It's it's both interesting and, and slightly frustrating because in, in Zhejiang, we, I personally, it's based on a lecture that Melanie did originally. We we take them through ways in which they can use their notes more effectively than just reading. And I, I tell them on numerous occasions, don't just read things. Just reading is probably the worst way you can go about learning something. You need to try and give more active approaches. And we, we take... We have quite a lot of content that's based around helping the students to take effective notes and then to use them effectively for revision. But as you say, Sophia, that it's not like they're all failing their exams. So maybe they're they're onto something. And I think the fact that they do this regular previewing and reviewing is probably very helpful. I think if we could somehow get a student who was willing to and had enough time to do both the Edinburgh approach and the Jajang approach, maybe we'd we'd have the perfect student. 
I think we can maybe do a, some sort of comparison for the result they have uh, between the two cohorts and see whichever works. Uh, so uh, next one, uh, I'm going to pre uh, present some learning collaboration, which is something we focus on because this is something we emphasize, but Edinburgh students seem not to do it very well. So uh, I, as we mentioned, the, the whole uh, living environment of the, of the students and the learning environment, most of Edinburgh students would have access to make friends, like wherever they can meet friends, basically where they live. And of course, if they are living in a huge city instead of a small campus, they get to be mixed up with people from all different uh, countries or programs or a uh, different age, different religion. So uh, they most of them make friends just among uh, the flatmates. And they're very close. Some of them are very, very good, close friends. They trust each other. They even open a, a joint bank uh, together when they start to rent a, a flat in the second year. So they do have very good collaboration, but more of um, kind of like a, like a support when they go, all go through very, very intensive exam months or week. And then maybe someone is having a, a mental meltdown and then someone else would go to the library with them and support them. But they rarely have any learning, study, preparing for exam together, exchange ideas because they are not really from the same program. But for Zhejiang students, it's very interesting. Uh, we are also very pleased that the academic family we are doing for both the cohorts are working very well. So academic family is basically led by one senior student who has been through the first year, they know what's going on, and they would be the, the academic parents. And then we have a first year student who would be the, the children, and they will be working as a group meeting regularly so that they can ask questions or they can have discussion, they can basically get support from them. And this is working particularly well in among the Zhejiang students, even though uh, we only have one, I think one cohort of students that's that's senior, right? Because that, that this is the, the the research we were doing are on the second um, cohort we've ever done in uh, the joint program. And another, another thing is the WeChat group. So all the students uh, from Zhejiang, from the same cohort, are in one WeChat group. And they have very frequent communication on a daily basis in terms of any learning problem they have. So I'm gonna give you a very interesting example. Uh, Michael, if you can click again to show the, the next page. So um, in, in Zhejiang, I'm gonna give you a little bit uh, of a, 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 a background. So in mathematics lecture, uh, the, the, the math lecturer uh, is not from UOE, it's from Zhejiang University. And um, basically he doesn't like to wear a microphone, but he doesn't speak very clearly and he's got very strong accent. So basically, um, long story short, no students could understand what he said. Uh, and the, this, the solution he had was to write down everything he wants to say on the blackboard. So, so this is something kind of posed a, a huge challenge for all of the students because first of all, it's already a very hard course they have to attend and they couldn't understand when the teacher is trying to explain to them and what they can do is only to, to, to read from the blackboard. So uh, it's interesting thing happened. They started to autonomously form this kind of support group in their WeChat group that if any students who happen to sit in the front row, then they have a responsibility to make the audio recording because only the front row can sort of hear what the lecturer was talking about. And then if if some students happen to sit in the middle, but a little bit back, that is where you take a whole big picture of the blackboard that has a very good view and you can see the whole picture. Then for the students who sit at the rest of the area, they would be just waiting patiently on the WeChat group because people would keep sending photos and photos and photos in the WeChat group. And this is how the rest of the, the cohort take notes and learn. Then of course, after the, the math class, uh, they, they went back home, they start to review everything and then people would post questions. Then people who, uh, the students who understood or who could explain, they would post their explanation or they would kind of like, um, 
uh, translate what the, the math lecturer said, and that they would post the, the answers and explanation to the WeChat group. So this is how they study together. And this, I think this is phenomenon. Uh, this, this, is, this is something we, it's, it's really shocking. And I think it works efficiently. So I don't know if it can be copied, but I think this definitely can say, Chinese students are good at working together uh, and uh, it, the collaboration works very well. Okay, so Michael, next one, please. Okay, so uh, after all the things we presented, I would want to put it together because we also uh, focus on the, their identity transformation. And I would say Edinburgh students from the very beginning, they see coming to the university as a new life beginning, as, as living in a, in a new city, as making friends, as social life. So of course, after the whole environment and how they, uh, they experience together, for the first year, a lot of students in the second year move on to live together in a private accommodation. They start to pay bill. They think about getting a second, uh, like a, a part-time job, or they think about getting some sort of um, way to be more uh, financially independent from their parents. So I would say it, Edinburgh students are transforming to more, towards like they feel like adults. So in the in the second interview, lots of students talk about they feel like this is such a grown up thing, and I've never done this. So this is intimidating, but it feels good. So a lot of students would talk about how they balance their life, how they would uh, try to get independent from the parents. But for Zhejiang students, it seems they are more transforming towards a better student. So they would, they would talk about they're not learning hard enough for the first year, they, they didn't really get a hang of it, they didn't know how it works. And um, they explored the new freedom from having a broader horizon and different perspectives. And so they, they are talking about how they benefit from getting the critical thinking skills, and they should do more reading and studying even more. And also a lot of students would say the way for them to grow up or getting into more of a living in a society is through uh, participating in a student society but because they are in a very com compact kind of um, campus and they never need to cook they never need to work so uh, they rarely mention things like those I feel so grown up they're just like I'm always quite independent from my parents I don't them, need them to do my laundry but they don't really need to cook or think about how they're going to make a living so uh, these are the huge um, import a huge difference between the two cohorts and I think um, it's quite closely related to their living and studying environment and also there are some cultural difference there are some curriculum design difference between the two cohorts I think these all contribute to this kind of uh, difference so that's the end of my presentation and I'll just give it back to Michael Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sophia. Um, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge the fact that um, Sophia was paid by the University of Edinburgh's Principals Awards Teaching Awards Scheme, which um, contributed money towards our project. And I want to thank all of our students who are in both Edinburgh and in the Joint Institute in Zhejiang to thank them for taking part in our study. Okay, that is all. Any questions? Thank you so much. So, okay, Dagua. Hi. Uh, yeah, time is pressing. I think uh, that's why I raised my hand. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you from the uh, most recent, uh, the last presentation. Thank you very much to both uh, Michael and Sophia for such a such an in-depth and insightful and also comprehensive, uh, I think, um, you know, evidence-based uh, this research. Uh, my question is, uh, we would like to obviously to know, uh, you know, to know more about this. Um, do you have a plan to get this published uh, sometime soon or <laughs> uh, so that it uh, can reach a wider audience? I think your findings are really, you know, help to get rid of the uh, some of these stereotypes about Chinese students, etc. And there are, you know, a lot of these uh, new insights, yeah, uh, which so the, the, the quick answer is Yes, there are plans. The word soon might be an exaggeration. <laughs> As with so many of these things, it, it, it sits around all the other work that we've got to do. Um, so yeah, yes, sure. we plan to, but 
who knows when that will be <laughs> yeah and uh, related to that if i may uh the because uh, that this is a presentation conference presentation sharing experience you obviously uh, reveal the identity of the partners the university Zhejiang and, uh, and edinburgh and and uh, we know that these are from these partnerships but in future publications do you think ethical issue could be uh, um I don't know what you prom promised those who who <laughs> offered this data, uh, an anonymous or, or yeah, or... yeah. So we're we're told that the all the, the students are, they sign an ethical permission and they they say they agree that their their quotes can be used, but that their names won't be used. So we we do have a an ethical consent process that they go go through for that. Um, uh, yes, I think if it was written in a paper, it would probably not include the university names. So they, those ones are always intriguing because you always know it's the university of the people who wrote the paper. <laughs> Book and guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, I don't know the maybe to give our other colleagues opportunities. Or I do have questions for the previous presenters. Uh, I yes, don't know how these are managed. Uh, we didn't have time beforehand. So, so no. I, I got to first. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Dr. It, Hussein has left, um, has had to leave. But uh, if you have questions on the first presentation, please go uh, ahead. Uh, right. OK, the first presentation, uh, again, as I said, it's uh, in the chat. It's a also very informative, stimulating. And um, my question on the, yeah, the case studies. Uh, I think the neural network was really it's, it's a really stimulating, wasn't it? Um, and and the technology required for those, um, I, I don't know, you know, uh, but it's a really, I mean, it's, it's a cutting edge, isn't it? Um, so my question, I guess, is about the learning styles and that colleague. Um, sorry, I, I, I forgot your name, it's <laughs> not immediate. I, I did take notes. Um, oh, this is Alan, by the way. Uh, yeah, Alam, Alam. Yeah, thank you, Alam, for 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 the uh, findings for your findings. Um, uh, one of the um, <clears throat> studies on learning styles about uh, Asian uh, learners uh, on their learning styles is that there's preference for uh, visual visual style. Yeah, and your uh, your in your research, your findings, um, obviously. That's the not uh, that's not the most preferred one by this group of Chinese students. Uh, is that right? Uh, yes, I think uh, we have actually visual is the third highest preferred mm -hmm. uh, learning styles. Right. Yeah. Uh, since we have decided to use two first two, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have considered uh, auditory and yeah. uh, the tactile. Yeah. But our third preferred style is the visual one. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think uh, the reason to consider the first two is that we have delivered our uh, lectures uh, in the like video, uh, as a recorded lectures, yeah, uh, and also um, and that's why we choose two. That and also another reason is that we have our students are engineering students, mm -hmm. so we have delivered labs. That yeah. means uh, that is one of the styles that we have actually adapted, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you're right that there are like uh, three styles mm -hmm. that has the highest mean score mm -hmm. uh, in our studies. One yeah. is the tactile, the highest is the auditory, the second one is the tactile, and the third one is the visual. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So the uh, differences, the gender differences between the visual styles, I think you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you also know uh, who, who who were higher, whether whether male or female students, um, uh, uh, on the visual on the visual preference? <laughs> uh, well, I think on the visual preferences, uh, we have not identified like which group of students. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably I have done other statistic analysis, but I don't have the present, uh, like the no, table on this. No, not to worry. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying yeah, to let you me know, just, uh, put you in a difficult position, digging out the details. <laughs> I'm just uh, genuinely interested when you had uh, said uh, you have that the difference. Yeah, uh, might uh, yes, be I useful think, yeah, to know. I'm just, yeah. I'm just quickly find out, yes. Okay, uh, okay, not in the slide. 
Yeah, uh, uh, maybe I we can I can get in touch with you about that maybe for uh, that detail. Mm, or yeah, uh, I am mm. conscious of time, and uh, other colleagues may have uh, other more interesting questions to ask yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, of all the speakers. Yeah, but thanks for for your effort. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Uh, Laura Ann has a question in the chat while we're waiting. Uh, she says, uh, do you actively, for Michael Dahl and Sophia Shan, do you actively encourage the use of WeChat as a teaching tool and are lecturers included in the group? Uh, no, we don't actively encourage it. Um, I think particularly in the last year, we've, we've, been, we've been slightly more positive about it. I think we, we worry about what we worry that when students rely on WeChat, we end up getting lots of lots of uh, communication that we can never confirm has happened. So, I th but I think for groups of students just talking among themselves, I think it's great. But it's not something we've actively pushed. That's all spontaneous, all um, yeah, developed by the students themselves. Thank you, Jamer. Joanne? Oh, that's Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Christine, I still haven't changed it. I just wanted to add to your answer, Michael. Um, so we did find WeChat very useful, especially when the students were off campus and they were working online. Because WeChat so immediate, they could have um, good discussions for tutorials. And we made it conditional that they had to post a copy of those chats so they could get screenshots and then put that up to share with all the students on the discussion boards so that we could see what they were doing. And the immediacy of WeChat enabled that. So it was a very useful tool. But um, I haven't been encouraging their use of WeChat for that purpose since they're now back on campus. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, John. I think, I mean, this has been a really interesting session, but we are over time. So I think we should um, stop here. If you have more questions to all of our great speakers, I'm sure you can figure out how to how to find them. Or you um, can put the, uh, quickly, the emails, your emails into the chat so sorry, people quickly, can contact can just, you easier. Oh, sorry. To my previous, uh, uh, like, uh, Dawn, actually, who asked about the visual one. I think in my study, I found, I found that, like, and the mean score for visual students for male students is 42, whereas for the female one is 39. So that means oh. that statistics tells us that the male students are more visually like a preferred method than the female students. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Okay. That's kind of interesting <laughs> insight. Uh, okay, so then for the speakers, thank you so much for your wonderful talks. It's very interesting, very uh, illuminating. Can you all put your uh, email address into the chat so people can contact you easier if they have any more questions? Because unfortunately, <laughs> well, we are running quite over time. If you're happy with that, that is yeah. Nice. And then thank you again for this wonderful session. Oh, and next week we will not have uh, this meeting. Uh, it will be May 10th is our next session because I believe next week is a holiday. So we'll see you again in May 10th. I'll send an email out soon. And thank you again and see you next time. Excellent job, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Excellent presentations. Yeah, uh, do, if we could have uh, the presenters' email addresses to follow up, maybe they on are, some of the. Yeah, the most of them have have shared them in the chat. Uh, in the chat, can we? When this uh, meeting finished, can we still access the uh, we, the uh, the chat? Uh, um, oh no. Uh, yeah, probably we are not able to uh, unless. You, okay, then I can <laughs> send. Uh, I can you send can take... an email afterwards with. Yeah, the... yeah. Could you? Could you? Uh, that's uh -huh. yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just send much. an email. Afterwards okay, with all that's their, very kind of you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah good point. <laughs> Thank you, Dagwa. <laughs> Thank you both very much. Thank yeah, you. For organizing okay. this, uh, you know, excellent. Uh, yeah.
presentation. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah. Well Hi. done, Sophia. That was so interesting. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. How are you? Yeah, I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's probably not. <laughs> it's still, still recorded. Let's catch up later. Bye. Okay. <laughs> See you. Bye. <laughs>